we are now recording. All right, welcome to a continuation of the previous Board of Trustees meeting. It's our March 1st, 2024 uh, continued meeting, uh, meeting here at 1 p.m. remotely. Um, Louisa, can I have you uh, take the roll call, please? Barahona. Present. Buenaventura. Present. Chen, not present. Cisneros. Here. Good. Here. User. Here. Shelby, not present. Soel. Present. Stallings. Present. Stevens. Present. Tony. Present. Trejo, not present. You have a quorum chair. All right, thank you. And just a reminder to everybody, this is a continuation of the meeting that we adjourn on Monday, for, uh, February 26, 2024. That notice of adjournment can be found online along with today's agenda. And as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. <clears throat> we will call again for public comments. Uh, State Bar staff will attempt to call members of the public in the order they appear in the attendee pool. For those participating via Zoom, you can raise your hand if you wish to address the board. State Bar staff will um, activate your microphone when it's your turn. When that is uh, activated, you'll have three minutes. There'll be an on-screen countdown that will flash in the final 10 seconds. And similarly, if you're calling in um, from a, a telephone location, um, you can raise, virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine to alert staff that you'd wish to make public comment. Um, I know we have one individual who signed up ahead of time, so we appreciate that. Um, is there anybody else in the public attendee pool who wishes to address this board at this time? But you could raise your hand at this time. I'm not seeing any additional hands raised at this time, Chair. Thank you. Can we go to the uh, individual who signed up ahead of time? Yes. Actually, one person did raise their hand just now. So we'll start with the first individual who signed up in advance. And I believe that's Angelina. Angelina, you should be able to address the board. Your mic has been enabled. Hi, good afternoon, uh, board and trustees. First and foremost, I wanna go ahead and thank the board for allowing me the opportunity to um, speak. I appreciate that. I know everyone's busy and COVID and all the above and trying to juggle everything. So I do appreciate you guys continuing to have and hold the meetings and allow for public comment. At this time, I just wanna take a brief moment to um, raise the issue to the Board of Trustees that, you know, it, it seems that there's been a, an abundance of attorney misconduct and it's been going on for decades, not just one or two cases or individually. Um, and it's been going on for years. In fact, my family has a published case from the Second District Court of Appeals dating back to 1956. And I actually have a copy of the state bar complaints that were submitted on behalf of um, my family that I have in possession, which I will be sending the state bar and, and copying the trustees. In addition to that, and it was it was pertaining to attorney misconduct, and we've seen the Girardi issues, we've seen multiple other cases over over a lot of time and that's gone on. And it concerns me as today I've just sent out three state bar complaints with evidence. And when I do the state bar complaints, I take it into consideration that the state bar does have a lot of complaints that come through. It takes a substantial amount of time to investigate each complaint and to due diligence. And it seems and appears that there are several state bar complaints that were submitted by my attorney or former attorney who was um, tragically murdered a couple years ago. Prior to the murder of Mark Andalucci, he submitted a state bar complaint in regards to attorney Max Statton, who is currently not eligible to practice law pursuant to the state bar's website. And Mr. Statton not only misled the court, but Mr. Statton um, intentionally deceived the court for the benefit of his client when he had in possession documents related to service. Mr. Andalucci did diligence, took time to prepare a well-founded state bar complaint, submitted it to the state bar. We, Mark was tragically murdered in 2020 um, I followed up with, a state, uh, with the state bar to inquire if they'd received the complaint. 
I received no notice from the state bar. So I went ahead and submitted a second state bar complaint with a sworn declaration from Mr. Andalucci. I received no correspondence from the state bar. Subsequently, last year, there was an investigation of another attorney for a false state bar complaint. Luckily enough, I had evidence to help with that situation and I was contacted by a state bar investigator and questioned and then asked if I had information. I provided information to the state bar investigator, which in turn turned out that that case was a false state bar complaint with a disgruntled client that just didn't want to pay a bill. Right, However, at I'm, that so, time, I'm so sorry, your three minutes is up. I do appreciate you addressing the board and we will, um, you know, there'll be opportunity at, at other meetings. I hope you do make public comment there and we will uh, uh, check with staff on, on some issues that you've raised. So thank you. Next right. we have, I apologize. Next we have call in user one. All right, call in user one, uh, your microphone is active. Could you please identify yourself? Hello, yes, I am an anonymous um, applicant who sat for the California bar exam, February, 2024 at Cal Palace, Daly City. Um, and I'm calling to complain about the inhospitable and unacceptable testing conditions that we were subject to. So first I'd like to complain about the extreme cold the extreme cold within the test center left most applicants shivering as they attempted to take the most important exam of their life. Test takers were unable to type at accurate speeds because our fingers were so cold. Instead of underlining and annotating the MBEs and essays, I had to place my hands under my legs while reading questions so they would warm up and function properly. My fingers were cramping from the cold so badly, I didn't think I would be able to finish my exam questions in time. Many people did not. There were inadequate access to bathrooms. In the North Hall, there were only two stalls open in the women's and men's bathrooms for what appeared to be a room of over 600 applicants. During the lunch break, applicants were prohibited from using the bathrooms. Instead, they were forced to use the bathroom during the examination period outside in one of the, the one available porta potty or not at all. There was an a re, unreasonable surcharge this year as applicants were charged $300 more than previous years, and yet cutting costs was cited by the California State Bar as an excuse for moving the testing center to Cal Palace for the first time in history, despite paying over a supplements were forced to complete the most important exam of our life under substandard and unsatisfactory testing conditions. Postings to recruit proctors were even broadcasted on X, formerly known as Twitter, and many proctors did not know what the, prohib the prohibited items were or couldn't answer basic questions when asked. I assume the severe lack of quality proctors can also be attributed to the previously stated excuse of cutting costs. This was an inaccessible testing location. As a result of the California State Bar's high interest in cutting costs, applicants were forced to make the trek to California, I mean, to Cal Palace testing location, which is in a remote area of Southern California, Southern San Francisco. There were, four, there were very few nearby hotels and none were walking distance. Applicants were forced to sit in the parking lot with only access to one porta potty and, and few, a few food trucks, that's all. Overall, the testing center met the expectations of a stadium dubbed Cow Palace and used to house livestock shows. It leaves you to wonder whether the State Bar of California vetted the testing location at all before cutting expense at the direct expense of paying applicants and affecting their fighting chance at passing this exam. The California bar exam in February is notoriously harder to pass in July. When you couple this proven statistic with the reality that most February bar uh, your three are minutes is up, and uh, thank you for uh, your feedback on the exam, and we do appreciate um, appreciate that insight. Lisa, can we go to uh, anybody that's left? We do not have any additional members of the public who wish to address the board. All right. All right. Thank you. This concludes our public comment period. I want to go to our. Um, miscellaneous items, which is uh, item 702. This is in regards to our April legislative reports. 
uh, pursuant to business and professions code 6086.20 and 6145.1. Just as a bit of an introduction, uh, we had a very um, robust presentation by uh, staff um, at our um, la the last iteration of this meeting. Uh, board members had uh, some input into uh, the layout and a request for staff recommendation. You should have received a three page document last night um, with the added work uh, from staff. I would just uh, note that this has been a massive undertaking. A lot of moving pieces is the understatement of the year. And I would just like to thank staff for their responsiveness to uh, the trustees concerns and our uh, desire to get this right. And so I think while it was regrettable that we could not have wrapped up our discussion um, on when uh, when this was uh, first set on February 26, I think it does provide a unique opportunity for um, our discussion to be uh, directed in a, uh, um, I think, in, a, in a, a, a good way. So with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Donna to walk us through uh, those three pages. Oh, you're on mute. Someone's got to be the first. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, trustees. Thank you, Brandon. Um, uh, as Brandon said, the um, following the input that we received on Monday, we put together the short memo, um, um, and uh, we also did some additional number crunching, which uh, which you'll see included in this memo. Um, my role today is to go through Roman numerals one and two in the memo that you have. Uh, very briefly, and then turn it over for uh, the most important part of today, which is your discussion of those issues. Um, so first, um, in um, the memo lays out a uh, staff's recommendation um, that we set a cap of $150 for the fee increase that is requested. Um, Leah mentioned this at the last meeting. Um, uh, and this was, uh, in our mind, this was something that uh, that we think it should be done in order to make the fee request palatable, despite the um, the uh, sort of the additional um, uh, issues, the additional items that we think most certainly could be funded with additional money. But we think that this is the most responsible approach. Um, so um, what we lay out here in what we're now calling maintaining public protection or sustaining core operations is meeting the first requirement of the statute, which is that we include in this report our calculation of the necessary fee increase to maintain our existing operations and service levels. Excuse and me, so, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm just wondering if um, board members would like this memo to be put on the screen. If that would be helpful, or does everybody have access to it? Everybody's fine? Okay. No, okay. no, I want it up. Oh, Please. okay. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Can you do that, Louisa? Or, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Donna. Go ahead. No I problem. Let me let Louisa get that up. everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Louisa. That's perfect. So where we are is looking at the recommended and prioritized components for that first requirement of the statute. Um, again, uh, the necessary fee increase to maintain existing operations and service levels. So we are recommending and prioritizing in this order. Um, Lease payment cost, the amount is the same that you saw on Monday. Um, and then contractual obligations to staff, meaning merit increases and COLAs, along with core operating licensee, uh, licensing, sorry, licensing costs. Um, IT licensing costs in, include things like um, significant increases that we experienced for IT licenses for things such as Microsoft related pro uh, products. DocuSign, um, network security related products, um, and other incremental increases that we saw across our extensive suite of applications. Um, those costs went up considerably. And so we um, uh, uh, those are something that we need funding for. Um, this, is, um, this is the item that had previously been entitled structural deficit. 
Um, next, you'll see um, uh, a prioritization for eliminating forced vacancy rates. That's a $39 per licensee increase to do that. Um, on Monday, we had a figure for um, PTO and, and staff sick leave accrual. Um, that, it, that was $14 per licensee. Staff's recommending that we eliminate um, that um, as part of our request. That would bring the total um, for this segment, maintaining public pr protection, to $95 per active licensee. Um, and this does reflect, you'll recall we talked about um, uh, on Monday that our projections were looking at a 0.3% growth in uh, the number of active licensees. Um, looking at uh, the historical numbers, we increased that growth, per uh, growth percentage expectation to 1%, which also adjusted the numbers a little bit. And so that's looking, looking at $95. Um, next, um, if you, thank you, Louisa. Um, next, we moved on to what we had called on Monday, expanding impact. Um, this really is sort of the increasing public protection. Um, this goes above and beyond maintaining the existing service levels, but including um, our assessment of programs that require additional support um, where we could improve service levels or add programs. Again, um, you'll see that um, this memo includes a prioritization that, that Leah and I recommend for, um, for those costs. OCTC staffing, followed by information technology, our client trust account protection program, um, the um, complaint uh, review unit, and then diversion. And you'll see there are some caveats there for, um, for several of those. So the OCTC staffing, as we talked about on Monday, is um, divided into thirds. And so this proposal would be 1450 in year one an additional 1450 in year two, an additional 1450 in year three. This would include um, the funding necessary to meet the caseload, pro uh, caseload processing standards, as well as the funding that's necessary to decrease the pending backlog to a more reasonable 20% from the 36% uh, figure that it's at today that Yuen had mentioned to you when she walked through the numbers on Monday. Um, with regard to the Client Trust Account Protection Program, one of the options that we're hoping you'll discuss is whether to assess this um, cost to all licensees, this expense to all licensees, or to only those who have a trust account. If um, the what you see here, this $8.75, is the amount that would be assessed if it went to all licensees. If you only assessed it to those licensees, um, who have a client trust account that would reduce for others the total amount here by 875. And for those who have a trust account, it brings it up to $19 that they would be assessed. Um, uh, and then um, you'll see also with, um, uh, as there we, we had talked about some um, caveats for the complaint review unit, uh, unit the complaint review unit, as well as um, diversion in terms of the amount. So the diversion program, for example, um, uh, is 650 for, um, uh, for the first uh, three years, but then we would reduce it to $4.50 because the component um, that covers the cost of the mandatory fee arbitration mediation program that's part of diversion, those costs would go away after, after three years. So our grand total, putting this together for increasing public protection of um, $50 um, and, um, I'm sorry, our grand total, yes, for increasing public protection is $50 for the total. The overall total for maintaining the existing service levels and then for increasing the services, service levels we could provide and the programming that we can provide, the total that we have here um, is $145. I know I went through that very quickly, but we talked a lot about it on Monday, and I um, I wanted to just sort of tee this up for you. Have you asked me or Leah any questions that you have, and otherwise just allow you to really have the discussion that you need to have to vet all of these options? Great. Um, if you could uh, take the 
presentation down so we can see everybody. Um, so as I understand it, we're going to be um, providing input on the amounts of the fee increase that we'd be um, that the board's comfortable with, prioritization of uh, the various items that you've just talked about, and then also issues relating to CTAP, um, and then possible ways for the the fee to be structured um, going forward. So um, I know there's probably going to be some questions, uh, but I would um, would like to keep our our conversation going with that in mind. As also in mind that we're uh, set to uh, stop at three o'clock. So I know there's some media discussions here. Um, so I just keep the, the time in mind though. All right, uh, first trustee, Ms. Hughes, trustee Huser. I just have one quick question on section C where it says current mandatory base fee of 404. That's the base fee with the increase we just approved earlier this week. Is that no. Right? No, I'm sorry. That 404 um, is the um, is the current fee that licensees pay. Um, there's a, a bit of um, math behind it, but um, but it's basically the general fund portion of the fee that is mandatory um, that licensees currently pay. And so what we're showing here is with that current base fee of forty dollars. The um uh current base fee, I'm sorry. Louisa, can you put your memo back up? The current base fee of um a mandatory base fee of four hundred and four dollars, um, that would go up to five hundred and fifty-four dollars. Scroll a little bit, Louisa, to so we can see C. Yep. Letter C. Thank you. Um, so current base fee four hundred and four dollars. Um again, that's the general fund. Uh, portion of anything that's mandatory, that fee would increase to $554 with the $150, $150 proposal that, that um, we've put forward today. Total fees, um, base fee, as well as other, um, as other uh, mandatory, as well as other fees that go into the general fund. Um, I'm sorry, other fees, not the ones that go into the general fund, as well as all of the other mandatory fees. Uh, is a total of six hundred and eight dollars. That's a twenty four percent increase over the um, over the mandatory the mandatory fees today of four hundred and sixty three dollars. Yeah, I think um, Trustee Heath, there, there's the parts that are general fund, meaning it supports all the things we're talking about today, and then there are mandatory fees that are dedicated special segregated funds, so client security fund, lawyer assistance program fund. And we aren't talking about seeking any fee increases in those, but you had to ask like, what are, what, like, just to look total, what are people going to be required to pay? Here it is. Um, so you can view it as the general fund mandatory or the all in mandatory. So that a uh, uh, licensee would pay the $608. So, so to them, that's what they would pay if, if it was across the board. Yes. Thank you. I have a question. All right, thank you, Trustee Huser. Any other trustees have any questions? Yes, I, I have a question. Yes, uh, Trustee Good. Yeah, so two questions. Um, one is, I see that the recommendation is that the cap is 150 and all of this total is 145. So does that mean that we potentially have $5 to play with or what does that mean? And then I have a second part to that, but maybe I'll look to Leah or um, Donna to kind of answer that. And then I did have a second part. I'll answer that, Donna. <laughs> um, you could look at it as you have $5 to play with. That IT amount there though is extremely rough. We shared with you on Monday mm -hmm. that we got a very high proposal in um, or, or framework in from the consulting team we're working with on this. And that proposal is being vetted by some other independent um, experts. And so the number that we um, got was like a one time amount of almost $80 per licensee. So we're working to whittle that down. So this is all to say you have $5. I wouldn't be surprised if, if I come back and say I need all of that for IT. But right now, yes, we. In, and of course, you can also make the decision to go beyond the 150. That's a, that's arbitrary. 
And then my second comment was, I saw that slated to be cut is $1.25 for the attorney representation pilot. And I just wanted to remind my fellow trustees about what that was. When the bar went through a multi-year evaluation of the disciplinary system um, and gross racial disparities in the disciplinary system, one of the um, proposed um, sort of linchpins to, to try to ameliorate that was to have kind of sort of akin to a public defender system, if you will, if attorneys met certain income thresholds, they would be given an attorney to go through the disciplinary process and then to evaluate that. So that amount is for a very small pilot program to then get data to see if that really is working the way that it was recommended that it would work, uh, which is to reduce racial inequities in the disciplinary system. And I would hate to see that on the chopping block because I think if we don't do it now, I don't know that we're ever gonna do it. And for me, that's just really important to give that a try and to get the data to do it. And it's not that expensive. Um, so that would be my one my one comment there substantively. Thanks. And I would just note um, that, I mean, certainly Lee and I weren't comfortable cutting any of these, um, but we do know that we're likely gonna be having, in addition to this, a one-time IT ask um, with an amount that is to be determined. And as I mentioned, the OCTC number um, would be growing um, for OCTC staffing uh, year two and year three. And so in an attempt to come up with sort of the, uh, with a defensible recommendation, that's that's why we ended up where we did with um, with those recommendations to cut the, um, the request related to the attorney representation pilot, the in-person meetings and the Jenny Commission. All right, thank you, uh, Trustee Tony. I'll go after Trustee Barahona. Trustee Barahona. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Trustee Tony. Uh, one question I have is, is the decision on the CTAP, if we make that decision first, would we have further information on including the attorney rep representation pilot? I guess my question is, uh, should we answer that first? Um, because then we would, have a sense of cost for per person. Would we be able to afford it? I guess is what I'm what I'm saying. That could that could be an approach. Again, I, I also want to raise with respect to the attorney representation pilot in particular. I think it was you, Trustee Barahona, that mentioned that this one might be particularly attractive to private funders. And when we met earlier to, um, for our own check-in, we talked about doing a funders briefing and trying to get some support for that. So that particular one, I personally yeah, yeah. feel very committed to it. And I, I do think there's some possibility for additional funding. But with respect to your CTAP question, that is a decision the board could make. As Donna mentioned, you have options for how to um, propose that the CTAP related fee be assessed. You could decide to only assess it to attorneys with client trust accounts. That's, I think, about 50, a little <clears throat> over 50% of your active attorney population. So for them, their fee increase would go beyond this 150. Um, but for others, you'd have quite, you know, a bit of room there to add other things. So that if trustees want to take up that issue first, um, totally your call, obviously. Okay. We'll get through the questions first and then have a game plan for discussion, for further discussion. Um, Mr. Tony, did you lower your hand? Oh, I'll, I do have a question before discussion. I'll just do my question now, which okay. is, can you remind me, we once saw a chart and I kind of forgot of what the annual bar dues are um, nationally. And I'm curious if, if um, either you have it or can give an idea of where does the 600 and change fit? Would that make uh, California the highest in the nation or... Um, just, you know, which I have no objection to, by the way, because um, I think we do more and I have more responsibility, but just for perspective, that it was just a question. I'll, I'll look for that deck, Donna. 
We, we, okay, great, great. We do have it. Um, I think one of the challenges, Trustee Tony, will be that we do that analysis based on um, that what we're considering the base fee. I'm not sure that we look at like the client security fund and these other add-ons when we do our comparative analyses. So we might not have that data, but we certainly will have for you the uh, base, the comparison to the mandatory base fee. I can tell you quickly, I just found it like the highest in the country right now. So comparable to our 404, so not including all of the client security fund, et cetera, is $650. That's in Alaska, $600 in Tennessee, 583 in Oregon, 565 Connecticut, 495 New Hampshire. So um, if we go up to our uh, a base fee of 554, we wouldn't be, you know, which is the comparable to the numbers I'm sharing with you. We wouldn't be the highest in the nation, no, but we'd be up there. Thank, thank you. That's exactly what I was trying to get perspective on. That's useful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Trustee Sowell. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm comparing apples to apples here. Um, the in the sustaining sort of core operations, uh, what was presented to us earlier in the week was that was $114. And now with uh, with the cuts and everything, we're we're uh um what you brought to us is now is $95. So for an apples to apples comparison. Um, yes, that that's correct. Okay. And then um I was tracking almost all the 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 numbers track back to what we had seen previously, except for the crew, uh, the complaint review unit number. And I was trying to uh, um, make sure I was following that one, but I I, I was a little confused by that. Could you, because th those numbers aren't, they aren't the same. I, I apologize. You're absolutely right. They are not the same. And here's why. Um, what we had referenced before um, on Monday was three dollars and twenty five cents as the as the ongoing cost um, to um, to sustain the work of the complaint review unit. What we had indicated was that there was um, an a, a, an as yet uncalculated number for backlog reduction. What we indicated that we would do and what we have since done, is using a similar methodology as we did for um, OCTC's backlog. Um, we identified a, an additional dollar and 25 cents per active licensee over three years to reduce that, that complaint review unit backlog to 20%. Um, and then the ongoing amount is that $3.25. So for the first three years, it's $4.50, and then it goes down to 325. Okay. okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, two other really quick questions, just just um, to level set for me, is on the Jenny Commission. Um, I see where right now we aren't recommending uh, to go forward with it at, with an amount there, uh, and I just want to make sure that that doesn't somehow fly in the face of what we the action we took at the last board meeting relative to to the the deal that was sort of struck. I, I guess I could or the agreement that was reached. Uh, as it related to the bar and the Jenny Commission. Do you mean with respect to um, bringing some interviews back in person? Correct. No, that would, no, that that cost just is needs to be incorporated into our budget. Um, and so we'd have to fund it. This, taking out this uh, component of the funding request means we would continue the status quo, which is that we're funding the, the Jenny Commission with the licensing licensing fee that we have, we haven't gotten any supplemental funding specifically to support the Jenny Commission. Gotcha. Thank you for that. And then the last thing is that <clears throat> the amount that you're recommending, the 145, does not contemplate uh, anything in the out years. This is just this is what. Um, um, the suggestion or what the recommend the staff recommendation is right now that we should present to the legislature for 2025, not anything beyond 2025. That's right. Yeah, except as Don has mentioned for OCTC that this is a um, embedded in this structure. It's going to grow every year for three years. 
But I think what you're getting at is the big question of the um, growth year to year in the cost of doing business that is not accounted for in this model. So a different approach would be we cost out what we expect, how we expect cost to increase, say, for the next five years, um, not adding any new programs, just the natural cost of doing business and building that in somehow to the fee. This doesn't do that. That helps to level set every, everything for me, uh, Mr. Chair, and then happy to go into the, the discussion that needs to take place going forward. Just a quick show of hands. Anybody have any questions before we get into discussion? All right, seeing none. All right, Trustee Sewell. I don't necessarily <laughs> feel like I want to lead off. Uh, <laughs> If you don't want to, I can. Someone would, else can. Would you mind, Mr. Chair? I, I, I want to process this a little bit more, please. Absolutely. And Mr. Tony, I'll get to you in just a sec. Um, did you have another question, or are you you okay? Okay. Um, so, as I understand staff's recommendation, they're recommending um, a maximum of one hundred and fifty dollars uh, increase uh, to the fees. You see the structure in which and the prioritization in which um, staff is recommending we approach this. Um, and if you go down to the fourth subset of the uh, of the memo, you see why staff broke everything down into $25 increments. This is something specifically that the legislature uh, re requires us to do. Um, and I think really from a accountability uh uh, standpoint, I think it's it's a good opportunity for us to continue our transparency and show exactly what the dollars are going to. So this discussion is really important um, in that um, you know it's, it's kind of the rubber meets the road, board priorities, what we are asking the legislature to fund. And so I know not every single thing is going to be funded, or you know certainly we've seen that in the recommendation, uh, but. I think the threshold issue is if is everybody comfortable with that one hundred and fifty dollar um, threshold? Maybe to say, you know what, I think it should be le much less, much greater. Yes, Trustee Tony. Thank you, uh, Chair Stallings. Um, I do believe that the amount that we request should be based upon the need and not an arbitrary number. And that the responsible thing to do is to let the legislature know what our needs are. They should be verified. We should back them up. We should not pad a penny. But I believe it is our responsibility as trustees to ask for what we believe is needed to for the state bar to meet its statutory obligations to protect the public. Um, I believe that we should let the legislators tell us if they want it cut. Then we can have that conversation. But I think it's wrong for us to negotiate against ourselves and to start cutting things, which in the previous presentation, when we met earlier, the staff made a case that this was a need, that each one of these items that they identified was justifiable. I believe them. I do not believe they're coming to us today saying we've changed our minds these things are not really needed, but they're coming back and saying, we're just not sure if it looks good to ask for everything we want. So our proposal is not to ask for everything we want. I know that in my experience, I don't believe in saying no to myself. I make other people tell me no. That is, that, that, that's what leadership is about. If we are confident that this is what we need to do the best that we can, that is what we should ask for. 
I will tell you this, the number that we put, the first number will never go higher, okay? It's most likely to go lower. That is why I believe it is very important to put in, restore each of these items that the staff is recommending we cut off and that um, I want to be clear, I do not support and will not support the current proposal in front of us. All right, thank you. Just from staff, what would be the total then if we, went, we were to include the items that have been cut? I don't, I don't have that right now if I'm looking. Um... For, for something to be able yeah. to do that. So have to I'll, 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 I'll do that math right now and get back to you after the next commenter. Okay. I think it was 168 from the last presentation. Um, but I think it would have changed um, maybe, but I think it was 163 from the last one, but we, we changed the uh, 114. Can you also just sort of remind us whether or not that included, um, that did not include, to, to the best of my recollection, uh, the uh, the significant need in the IT area? You're right. It didn't include that at all. Let's let Donna do it, and then yeah. we'd have the, a discussion. The maintaining public protection number is uh, $109, um, and then I will go on ahead and tally the uh the other number trusty user while uh, we're doing some math go for it um I would just say I mean I certainly appreciate the staff's work here and you know, that all of these things are things that we feel we need and all of that. But I'm not convinced based on some of the discussions um, of, of what we need, like, you know, that we have these huge backloads of cases and things that we've done what we need to do in order to achieve the efficiencies and the staffing and requests like these, which are basically to pay for additional staff as opposed to increasing efficiency in those processes caused me some concern. I think a 24% fee increase is, is astronomical in a time, particularly these economic times, and could be very meaningful and problematic for certain members of the bar. And I think if we're going to just say, let's you know let throw everything in and hope for the best, um, if we're getting to, you know, just mentioned just now was another $60, which would be something higher than 24%, I would have a very difficult time voting for a fee increase of that magnitude without an assessment of, you know, what we can do to increase efficiencies in the operations. Mr. Chair? Um, the, t the increase, I'm sorry, the, um, breaking this segment, this up into the two segments, maintaining public protection would go from $95 to $109 and then increasing public protection, assuming it's $8 and 75 cents for the CTAP cost across all licensees. Um, is um, $169.25. I left out of that the $2 for the EOB, the elimination of bias. You can add that in or not. That's a, sort of a, a question because as we discussed on Monday, roughly 70% of attorneys currently pay that. It's an opt-out. And so what we're proposing to do is turn that opt-out to uh, a mandatory fee. Um, and so it's sort of an argument of whether you count that $2 or not. If you're going to count it, it's $171.25 per active licensee up from the $145. 
And just as a reminder, we have said that there would be a one time, we anticipate a one time um, need for, uh, for IT um, that is not included in these numbers just yet. All right, Trustee Buenaventura. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a procedural question and maybe some of the members who were part of the legislature before and could help me out on this. And that is when the discussions, um, you know, um, are at the Capitol and they start talking about our proposal and our budget, is it an up or down vote on the amount or do they go line by line or, or could they uh, come back with an amount that they deem more reasonable. I'm just curious about how how the discussions are and what possible outcomes could happen based on um, their assessment of our proposal. If I may, Mr. Chair, the um, so uh, we've had some communication with legislative staff um, about the components of the April report. Um, the components that we laid out here for you. Um, and as you see, Louisa, you've got that at the exact right place. Um, and Brandon mentioned, they have asked us to say in $25 increments, what, um, if we only got $25, what would we get? If we only got $50, what would we ask for? If we only got $50, what would we ask for? If we only got 75, what would we ask for? They've asked us to do that as well as to outline with specificity all of our requests for maintaining public protection and expanding public protection to say, you know, what's that $15.75, for example, for IT? Why is that needed? What's that going to cover? If you didn't get all of it, what would be what would would be the um, the outcome? They did that so they could they could presumably give legislatures the most um, flexibility to say, oh, well, this makes sense to us. This is convincing to us. Um, this is our legislative priority this year as a legislative body. So we think that you should put this number with this number with this number, and um, or we're not comfortable with an increase more than X. And so we'll go with your recommendation, State Bar, but we're only gonna do it up to you know, $75 or $175, whatever it is. Um, but they can they really have, have um, a lot of flexibility um, in terms of figuring out the um, what we've told them and what resonates the most with them. Thank you, that was very helpful. Great, I'm gonna to turn to the San Francisco uh, trustees meeting. Yes, I, I had a question. Um, Trustee Tony, um, you know, put his view as to why we should ask for everything that we need and not cap it at $150. And I thought it would just be useful to hear the countervailing argument um, about why 150, why that's going to fly and why that's the kind of the best way to proceed here. Um, and also I'm interested in, you know, if we do this this year, 24% increase Sounds like we're not going to be able to get another increase for some period of time. And what does that do to us as well? So kind of a two-part question. I want to hear the response to Trustee Tony's uh, perspective so that we can all evaluate it first and then talk about what this would mean for the future if we ask for $150. Thanks. So sure, I, I don't know if there's a staff member who wants to respond and then I'll also get my perspective. Okay, I'll, I'll just say that um, for me, one, I want to acknowledge that 150 is arbitrary. I don't want to pretend that there's a magic. This isn't science. But I do feel like there is a number that is too high. For me, that is absolutely certainly anything in excess of $200. I'm just thinking of the, um, the, the gut check reaction. I'm also very conscious of feedback we had from Senator Umberg last legislative cycle and now this one i've seen it quoted recently about getting our licensees on board with this fee increase and how that's very important um, to him i am not going to suggest that we're going to get like 51 percent of our licensees raising their hand and saying yes you know we support the fee increase but i do think that we put a number out there that's too high 
it's going to turn people off so much that we aren't, we're going to be pushing this rock more uphill than we need to. That's my concern. So again, go higher. I, 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 I do think it makes sense though, to be mindful about the perception and sort of the, um, the messaging and the outreach that needs to be done once we settle on this number. And so I know for me personally, I feel comfortable at around 150. It's a lot of money, but we had one fee increase in 25 years. And to your point, we're going to get one and we aren't going to get another one very soon. Likely, unless we work out a miracle and get an annual uh, CPI adjustment. So what do we have to do with this money? We have to use it wisely as we have. You know, one of my counter retorts to you guys are inefficient or you don't manage your money well is... What kind of organization can have only one fee increase in 25 years and not be insolvent, right? We've had to manage our money well, and we will have to going forward again. So I don't know if that's a great uh, counter argument, but it's my uh, honest perspective on this issue. Yeah, just to add to that, and uh, Trustee Huser, when you asked your question about efficiencies, it brought to mind presentation that we received um, a study of uh, discipline caseload and uh, we we're able to look at the mandatory licensing fees that were paid out per complaint California is just over five thousand dollars all states averaged seventy two hundred dollars and the large states kind of comparable to us was about eighty three hundred dollars so I think that's certainly something that staff wrestles with on a daily basis and I know George has has uh invested a significant amount of time into pursuing new efficient ways uh, to go after the, the worst actors and to deal appropriately with the lower uh, priority cases. So, you know, certainly we're going to strive for efficiency, but to echo Leah's point, um, we do need that increase. We need, we need the funding in order to uh, continue this work. Um, I, so one of the things I've been able to do is, uh, have significant contact with various stakeholders, both in the legislature and those that we like, you know, that, that we oversee our licensees. Um, and I certainly share in the sticker shock uh, type um, concern where if we ask for a number too high, then I, my fear is that it's going to turn what is already a delicate situation and make it incredibly, to incredibly uh, toxic. Um, I think the legislature has been very receptive in hearing what we're asking for and requiring us to, you know, to say exactly what that money is going to go to. My concern is that if, um, you know, if, if we ask for everything, I certainly understand if we don't ask for everything, then, um, you know, we could be negotiating against ourselves. If we do ask for everything though, I would be concerned about, um, maybe this interest in the legislature to give us a few increase for it to be like, okay, well now you're asking for, for the moon. So we're going to give you nothing or we'll give you very little. So that's my concern just in, in all the conversations I had. Trustee Good, does that give you uh, some context or is there anything else that you are asking for? You know, I, I, I just wanted, uh, I just wanted that view articulated. I thought that was important for our discussion. Um, You. Trustee Swell. <clears throat> I think I want to associate probably uh, my thoughts probably with 90% of what it is that Mr. Tony articulated. Um, I think the one thing that uh, um, does concern me in um, uh, the course of this conversation is how we think about the out years. Uh, as Leah indicated and it's hard for me to, th to think I've only been, I've been on this board for you know a few years and I'm one of the old timers here. But the the to note the fact that um, and I think this is this is something that we all should really really sort of take to heart. And you know, as somebody that's worked in this this building I in in the capital for and worked in the capital for many years, I don't know any other state entity that in a 25 year period received one fee increase. None. I don't know anybody else that, that that's happened to. And as a result of that, I really do feel like 
And I think we asked, had asked this question at, at one point in time previously, is if we had just kept up with the CPI um, uh, over that 25 year period, what our fee uh, amount would be uh, at the, at this juncture. And if, if we have that number would be, uh, I think that would be uh, important uh, for, for folks to hear. Um, I do think that it is, as, as the chair mentioned, it is incumbent upon us to make the case. And there may be a threshold amount that we think of for this year but I'm keep, I keep, in my mind, I keep thinking that we need to be planning for the future. Uh, we should not be thinking a, a, about the fact that we're going to get one fee increase over the course of the next 25 years um, and need to figure out a, a game plan relative to how we um, either have something annualized in terms of as it relates to CPI or is, there are subsequent junctures where, you know, um, we have this fee, uh, this fee conversation. I think the last thing I would say is that for those of us that participated in uh, in the oversight hearing last year, I think that the uh, we have in the run up to that that uh, oversight hearing, as well as post that oversight hearing, in terms of our conversation with uh, with members and with staff, they all know we set the tone very very clearly that they all know that we need we need a fee increase, and uh, and that even if we sold the building that it was only gonna get us through 2024. Um, and um, so, I, so I'm so i feeling, uh, like I said, somewhere in associating my, myself with probably 90% of uh, what Mr. Tony articulated um, with this notion that if, if we somehow set a threshold for ourselves, um, that threshold has to uh, in, uh, take into consideration what we're gonna be asking for in 2026, what we're going to be asking for in 2027, some sort of three year, five year, some period of time uh, by which we're also going to be thinking about what we need in the out years and not think about this in, 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 in a, as a one time shot. The number, um, uh, the inflation adjusted number is 709. That would, that's what the licensing fee would be. All right. Anybody else wish to talk about the overall um, ask? Any other perspectives? Yes, Trustee Stevens. Yeah, thank you. Um, robust discussion, and I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the additional information that we've gotten from staff. I I think that we need to make the full court press. Um, if if what we're doing is in, intentional about protecting consumers. We need to get the resources together to do that. And if the state bar in the last 26 years hasn't had a meaningful increase, obviously the, the consumers are let down by that fact. And it shows in the backlog that OCTC has. I think uh, I agree with trustee Huser that we, we at least have some optics that we have to overcome. And those include whether in fact, we are being efficient to resolve those backlogs. And I, I might not be inclined to call um, the diversion program, the diversion program, uh, partly because it doesn't clearly articulate. It, it, it sounds like we're soft, soft selling discipline as opposed to uh, trying to be helpful in clearing the more minor offenses off the docket so that we can address the more serious concerns. But that's that's more optics and more something for staff to address as they press forward. And just very briefly on that final point, um, the um what, whatever the trustees would like to would like to call it um that uh, is responsive to a different statutory requirement that we produce a report and it specifically says making a recommendation on a diversion program that could be codified and so that's why we've adopted that language george did you want to say anything more on that um 
Yeah, so we can obviously call it diversion program for minor offenses. That's the intent, and that's what the legislation re legislature has referred to. So I think adding that would probably address your concern, and that would also be consistent with kind of the legislation's legislator's directive. I also just wanted to make clear that the OCT staffing that is recommended um, is in large part staffing to improve the time of our cases. In other words, it's staffing that is needed to move towards the SB 211 case processing standards from our current case processing standards, which would be an improvement in case processing time over our current position. So I think that's important to remember as well. And that too is in accordance with the legislation, legislators um, directive. That's what they wanted to see in terms of a staffing needs analysis. Thank you, Mr. Cardona. Um, I, I try not to call on each individual trustee because you know if someone doesn't have a perspective they want to share, then I don't want to force them. But I, I would look to trustees Trejo and Barahona. I know you've had significant insight and comment in the past about various financial issues. So if there's anything um, that you wish to share or discuss, that would certainly be, uh, be appreciated. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. Thank you for, for that invitation, uh, Chair. Um, I, I would say a couple of things. One is I, I feel like we just, we need to strike a balance between going full court press and the recommendation that staff have put together. That it would be my sort of my sort of gut instinct here. Uh, secondarily, I think if the CPI increase has been rejected um, in the past, I think we have to make a case for why it should not be rejected in the future. Um, I think that laying out um, what would have occurred and how we would be protecting uh, consumers and the public had we uh, kept a CPI index increase over the last, I think you said 25 years, um, where we would be. So I think we're, we're I, I think that has to be a consideration going forward. Um, so that's my, my, my other thought. And then, you know, we're battling against what we need as an, or, uh, you know, where we're saying we want to increase efficiencies. And I have a, a high degree of confidence that staff are doing that, but we're doing that with inefficient systems. So we're just in a catch 22. Uh, that's what it feels like, at least from my perspective. So, um, uh, the IT sort of portion and asks are really critical and, and, and needed. I would say that we we would we may want to consider um, the liability and exposure if we don't include these. So I, I think there's a balance here to, to be struck. I think that the recommendation of the staff is what I would pursue with an additional amount. Um, and perhaps reassessing the things that have been struck as we maybe, you know, adding one or two of those back in, but also really aiming to, to get this sort of CPI um, increase included going forward. Um, I think that I think that feels important. And the sticker shock is real, the perception is real, the uh, news articles are real. So I think we're trying to balance that um, that tension. Um, and ask for what we need. So I think I think we got to strike a balance here uh, is, is my thought right now. I agree, thank you. Yes, Trustee Trejo. Um, so I think that there's, um, I mean, I feel like I, I, I've, I've spoken a lot to this, um, but I do just want to say that um, there's two ways that this proposition can go. Um, because I do feel that, and, and, and I think there's there are other trustees that could probably give me a better sense of what the sentiment is, but I can't help but to feel that we're not coming from a place of credibility necessarily. Um, and, you know, due to past issues, you know, most of the interaction that posed that people have had with us has been negative. And I think that we've done a good job of identifying staff has certainly about some of the key places where we need help. Um, but in approaching legislature or key key stakeholders, we have to be mindful that there is that they're 
approach with, with, with some background to why we're approaching them in this way with this magnitude of a, of a, of a possible increase. Because you do, and I, this is a word I've used before, that you do run into the possibility of being perceived as tone deaf, that despite some egregious behavior in the past, um, we're coming in with a 24% increase. That is a significant increase, right? Despite the fact that we genuinely do need it. And this is clear. So I myself, frankly, don't know who, you know, how to get that pulse from the people that are, are who is going to be our ultimate audience. We do certainly represent our, you know, the, the, uh, the body of attorneys in California, but just in, in talking to folks, I don't know how this is going to be ultimately taken. You know, part of me, you, you know, if, 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 if I'm, going to give the benefit of the doubt, I'll see this is coming from a place of a lot of construction, a lot of focus, but at the same time, how credible are we to ask for this 24, 24% increase and expect that any changes are really going to happen, whether it be in some of the proposed options or in some of the, just some of the current processes that we have in our organization. So that's where this is just purely an observation strategically as you know, when we start talking to folks, I just, I think that you know, yes, there is a need, uh, but this this is also a significant a significant increase. Yeah, absolutely, well said. Um, I, I will just say from my discussions with uh, various stakeholders that there is still a distrust um, in the in the bar and in what um, you know what we ask for, and that is one of the reasons why the legislature really can. You know, validly really wants to know where this money is going to. So, well, significant so my, progress has been made. Me, but my question then would be is, it, what would you guess would happen if we do propose something like this? Right? I mean, given what other trustees, uh, and perhaps you, uh, Trustee Stallings, based on what you know of the sentiment, how will something like this, irrespective of the great work that's been put into this, how is that going to be taken? once presented? I think that we are able to really tie all of these um, priorities to legislative mandates and to ultimately protecting the public. So I think that we can we can absolutely make that case. And so I'll say exactly what I tell you know victims whenever, before we go to trial is I'll never promise you a particular outcome, but I'll promise, I promise to work as hard as I can for a just outcome. And I think that's, that's all that we can do in this situation. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a market difference from asking, you know, going from 150 up to uh, you know about 170. I don't know if that $20 makes a difference. Um, I know that there's psychology behind pricing. Um, you know, why you have the 0.99 instead of a zero zero at the end of prices, and I don't know if if we run into that situation or or not. Um, I do, you know, reckon uh, I, I do, you know, really appreciate the amount of work the staff has put into this. And I think kind of like just in, in all walks of life, I think that there's this kind of this feel for a number that sounds maybe right and feel a, a number that sounds um, like it, it could encompass, maybe bridge that, that divide between absolutely everything that we need and what might be more palatable. And so in my view, that 150 kind of strikes that, that balance. Could we ask for more? Absolutely. Should we, and we may just be asking for more trouble than, than we'll get from that $20. I, um, just offer something. I think if we were able to get an annual CPI adjustment, that would go a long way um, in, in many regards, including allowing us to fund some of these things that are stricken, um, certainly some of the lower dollar value items. So, you know, I also like the board to consider maybe leaving the request as it is or modifying it slightly, but really focusing on adding this annual CPI adjustment um, because, because I think we might achieve both goals then, like stability and the ability to fund some of these items that have been stricken. Yeah, I would certainly support that. And I think one of the, the um, opportunities that we have in the fee bill this year is to continue to edu educate 
uh, legislators that are new to um, assembly and uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. And um, I, some of the feedback that I've gotten is that um, there's questions about why the state bar um, is treated differently than you know other licensing agencies. And so I think even the legislator is, or individual leg legislators are, um, are curious about kind of why you've been treated a little bit differently. So that might uh, provide an opportunity for us to get that CPI and for a little bit more of an increase. So as far as, uh, I think kind of on one end, I'll just call it a $170 ask compared to the $150 ask of staff's recommendation. Um, I don't know if we need a resolution, but I would like to just get a temperature to see if there's significant support for either the 170 or the 150. And Louisa, does that require any sort of, um, any sort of roll call vote or can it be um, a consensus vote? Roll call vote. No, no, no. This is oh. not agendized for a vote. Yeah. So yeah. I think you just um, could have people like raise their hand or just this sure. is give staff some direction, some sense of the will of the board, right? Without a resolution, so that we can then because there is one other portion I want to make sure we get to, which is how the fee would be structured. And I'm not sure what you're asking us to raise our hand about. What is the exact question? Whether we support 150, whether we support 170, or whether we don't support either? Is that three questions? Great. <laughs> I'll ask one question. So the first question is, uh, do you support the 150 um, threshold? So if I could just see a show of hands. Okay, so I see one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, all right. And then on, do you support the 170? Let's see a show of hands. The trustee Stevens, Tony, Sewell. And then support neither number and have an alternative recommendation. One question, Chair. I'm sorry. I yes. would support. I would support the 150 plus the CPI. Okay. Is your 170 assuming the CPI, or yeah. it is? Yeah. Okay. So sorry. I'd go 170 then. Apologies. What do you mean it assumes the CPI? I thought the 170 was bringing back everything that had been deleted. Yes, but whatever number we have, I thought we had agreed that a CPI is a good thing to include in the ask, regardless of the number. Right. So yeah, let me, let me just get a quick consensus just on the CPI issue. Everybody <laughs> agree that we should include CPI as an ask? Anybody yes. strongly disagree? Yeah, I think general consensus is yes on the CPI. Okay, sorry, Leanne, to your next point. Me? No, I think um, so it sounds like we're going to add the CPI and it sounds like we have yeah. a little bit more towards the 150 plus the CPI. What, what is the CPI number? The consumer price index, so it changes. So I, I know what it I know what it means, but what would we expect that number to be? I think between like one and three percent. I don't know our yeah. selling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This recent, this most recent uh, budget, we incorporated three percent CPI, but it yeah, it does change year over year. Chair Stallings, may I ask you to redo the straw poll? I sure. with uh, Trustee Barahona doing a clarification. I don't recall where we were at. Would you please? Right. And, and okay. Okay. Stall, um, uh, Mr. Chick, can I just make just one other sort of observation as well? Um, sure. And that is that whatever number that we go into the legislature with, uh, and this goes to sort of Mr. Tony's point and, and whatnot, this is going to be, a, there's going to be a negotiation here. And so um, 
if we go in with 150, we should be expecting to get it. If they're dealing with this in $25 increments, we might we might be thinking that um, expect to get something lower, which might be 125 or might be 100. And so there's a part of my thinking in terms of as I'm evaluating this, and that is that there is going to be some back and forth potentially here. And uh, and so we should be going in with uh, a number that is real and that is defensible. But uh, if it gets cut down, uh, we can live with some of the consequences of how it gets uh, how it gets reduced. Yeah, that's that's a, certainly a point well taken. All right. So with CPI thrown into the mix with uh, Trustee Sewell's additional comments, let's redo the straw poll. Um, if you are in favor of the 150, if you could raise your hand. Okay. And if you're in favor of the 170, please raise your hand. You know what? I'm sorry. I didn't get the in in San Francisco. I did not take note of your hands. Sorry, Sarah. Can you? Uh, did you go for 150 or 170? 50. We were both 150. Okay. okay. So I'm just doing some math here. One. All right, well, my count six for 150 and then four for 170. So certainly not like a strong consensus towards 150 or towards the 170. Is there any is there anything that would be able to uh, convince either side uh, one way or the other, or is that everybody's pretty much in the 150 or 170 camp? Okay. All right, um, based upon the, uh, cons the consensus um, and the show of hands, we'll proceed on the 150 staff recommendation. All right now, going towards. I'm sorry, Leah. Did you have something to say? No, I, I just wanted to make sure if were you going to take us to this options for structuring the fee. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, are we going to? I do. We need to have a discussion though on the prioritization. There's two different options on that. Um. Yeah. Or would you prefer to get to the structure? What's your call? Are you... Yeah, I. I would prefer to talk about the prioritization briefly. Um, I don't know if any trustees feel strongly one way or another about the two different options. That's going to be on page three of that three page contract or um, MOU. And then um, now it's up there on the screen. Just point out that neither of these options exactly. Um, responds to the legislative directive because they both have increments that are greater than $25. Mm -hmm. um, option two, where contractual obligations to staff and elimination of forced vacancy rates are grouped together, that's some, um, based on some feedback I received from the chair and the vice chair, basically saying it's really, uh, this, uh, I mean, we have to accept that this is totally um, artificial anyway, just trying to do it and trying to package it this way. But setting that aside, even trying to break up things like our contractual obligations to staff, um, it's very difficult. It doesn't all fit in these neat $25 buckets. So, but we do have to submit our request in something that looks like this structure one way you could get to really achieving the 25 for um, 
item two or the, uh, um, the vacancy rate adjustment is to prioritize certain groups of staff, for example, OCTC staff, and then the rest of State Bar staff, it is would be extremely problematic. Um, certainly with respect to COLAs and merit increases, I don't actually think we could do it. We could do that for the vacancy rates. But if, if the board, so really to get your reaction and then um, if you're comfortable submitting a request this way, which is not exactly responsive to the statutory uh, direction. All right, any thoughts on that? All right, and just kind of to start things off, I, I'm comfortable with the way that staff has listed it. I think, you know, oftentimes government is accused of, you know, inflating costs in order to get that, um, you know, to, to get that, that big uh, uh, money designation. And here, I think we earn credibility by saying, hey, this is the actual cost of $21 for lease payments or 26 for the COLAs. And I think staff has really tried to fit with the spirit of the legislative intent, but also telling the legislature, this is our bare bone um, proposal. So I, for one, am comfortable with that. Any other thoughts, comments between option one and option two? Seeing no hands, is there a general consensus then for option one? The staff's recommendation is the needs um, as they see them. I can just get a show of hands. If you need a minute to look at it. Or does anybody have any questions for staff about prioritization and what, what went into that? I have a question. Um, yes. It seems to me the only difference is that number two, in, in option two, number two is split between two and four in option one. Is that correct? Yes, that's the difference. Yeah. So I don't, I'm agnostic. So whatever you guys think is best, but they're, they're both be funded, I would presume. Is there a way that it can be, uh, you know, you can use this format, which I think has some value, but plugs it into what, the, what was requested? Like to actually to get $25 increments out of it. Is that what you mean? Instead of some of these are big or bigger or smaller than 25. Right. Like, is there, is there any value to the legislature seeing, you know, 0. 0.05 instead of $9 or whatever it would be? Yeah, I think we can, we can try to present it that way for the $26 for our contractually committed COLAs and merit increases. I think we need to leave that as it is because there isn't a way that we cannot do, do a portion of that. Um, for the vacancy rate adjustment, as I said, we could split that up and sort of prioritize groups of staff. That that would mean you would prioritize full staffing in certain areas of the bar and not others if only a portion of it was going to get funded. But we could certainly do that. And then for some of these others, we could kind of group them together so you get you hit that 25 or very close to 25. We can work on uh, restructuring this a little bit with that in mind. Okay, so can I get a general consensus then um, as to option one? Everybody in general consensus with that? Just with, okay. with a restructure, I think maybe. Be with a restructure, correct. Okay. San Francisco, I see, I see your hands. All right. Looks like we have a good general consensus on that. 
Any other comments on that before we move on to another meaty area? Okay. Trustee Stevens, I see your hand is still up. Any any comments or are you good? Okay, you're good. Trustee Brown, okay. Great, all right. Uh, Leah, let's go on to uh, structure. Louisa, so you could put up the PowerPoint. So while she does that, you'll recall that right now we charge a flat fee per licensee with some limited um, uh, subsidies, I guess, or cost reductions for certain groups of attorneys, attorneys under a certain statutorily set income level, attorneys working in legal aid. Um, we have worked up uh, different uh, alternative structures for the licensing fee that mo would move us away from flat fee to what I call potentially more progressive fee structures. Um, the intent behind this is to one, uh, inject more equity into our process, but two, um, to be able to mitigate this significant cost increase for some groups of attorneys potentially. So if you could go to the first slide, Louisa. So this is um, the fee option one, this is called the practice sector model. And this is all illustrated with that $150 that was just, you know, the proposed potential max for illustration purposes. So in the practice sector model, attorneys would be charged a different fee based on what practice sector they are in. So you can see for a $150 fee, if you just look in scenario one, just because it's easier for, for me, large firm attorneys and corporate attorneys would pay $300. So a $150 pro rata increase would translate to a $300 increase for those in large firms and in a, a corporate setting. And then conversely, you can see that solo practitioners and attorneys in nonprofit settings would pay $75. So you are cost shifting towards those in uh, large law firms with 100 or more lawyers and corporate uh, settings. And you are, uh, the benefit of that is solo practitioners, um, attorneys in nonprofit settings, government attorneys, small firm attorneys. So that is the practice sector model. If you look over in scenario two, everywhere where you see a negative number, that means that the absolute dollar value of what an attorney in that sector would pay, even after a fee increase, is less than what they are paying today. So solo attorneys overall would have $104 reduction. Those in the nonprofit setting, whatever that is, $127. So certain groups obviously really would stand to benefit from a practice sector-based model. We have this data from attorney self-reporting. It is now a mandatory requirement that every year you report your practice sector. So that's where we get this data from that you see in the active attorneys column. Let's go to the next one. This is a years of practice model. So you can see the same kind of concept. If $150 is the base fee and fee increase in scenario one, those with 16 to 30 years of practice would pay that 150. Those below 16 years of practice would pay less and those above six, uh, 30 years of practice would pay more. Under, the, under this approach, going to scenario two, those with zero to 15 years of practice would pay less than they're paying today. And then quick, quickly go to scenario three. So this is the income-based model. Um, I just want to say, in terms of data, years of practice we have because we have all the admissions data. Very easy. There's no requirement that attorneys report. Income data, we have it for about 100,000 attorneys from 2022 who did report it in their um, the annual census. We extrapolated it to the population of 196, but this is, the, um, this is probably the most difficult data for us to get and certainly to audit. But you can see here the fee increase hits those at 200,000 and income and above the most. And those with incomes less than 100,000 would receive a fee reduction based on what they're paying today. So those are the three different models. The only thing I'll say before I turn it over to you all is that we did send out a survey to all state bar licensees. Hopefully those of you who are lawyers received it. I don't know what our count is as of today, Louisa, because I haven't looked at the data, but we, I think our at last time I saw it, we had about 10,000 responses and attorneys were asked to rank 
these scenarios and the status quo. And very interestingly, practice sector and income-based were most likely to be selected as their first choice. Um, now, I haven't cross-tabbed that to which type of attorneys responded to the survey. It's obviously a lot of solo practitioners did. Um, so we're in the very preliminary stages, but we certainly will start to get in and analyze this data coming from our um, licensees. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I know. Can I? To go. I yeah. have to go. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to say, I think the income base seems most equitable, but I appreciate that it's a nightmare to audit and get the info. And so in light of that, I support scenario one, um, but with a modification. And I suspect Trustee Huser may agree, but we'll see. Um, I think saying that all in-house corporate counsel are the same, um, uh, is not accurate and i think you will want to do some sizing there so if somebody is at a you know 200 million market cap nasdaq company uh or they're at a very large you know uh very very large public company in the billions market cap i think um the fee should uh, reflect that kind of the way that it does on the private law firm side. So I support that with that um, uh, kind of adjustment. So there should I be think some is more sizing. Applicable. Sizing probably based upon something that's easier to audit, like the size of the company. Market cap is an easy one to look at. Maybe um, uh, somebody else might have a better suggestion, but but I support that. Thanks. Yes, Trustee Huser. Yeah, I was certainly going to make that exact point as well. Um, but I also think these um, the increase amounts as they've been segregated here are a little blunt. So in other words, from a medium firm to a large firm, it's double. So we can mitigate some of these 125% increases, et cetera, by you know, taking those numbers and making them less blunt at some level, um, because it seems to me the difference between a large firm and a medium firm is, you know, at the margin is quite limited. And so doubling the fees um, seems a lot to me and very blunt, but I like the concept of doing it, um, grading by type of business. Um, on the second option, I think you have to look carefully at the over 30 years because you have a number of people who are in the you know twilight years of their career whose income may be declining that kind of thing so i'd be very um hesitant to use that blunt measure of over 30 years and such a blunt increase there and then for the uh, fee option i think having some combination of um uh, three and one um, would be ideal because a solo practitioner could be making millions or billions of dollars just as much as a, you know, somebody um, in, you know, some other type of firm or something. So I, I support kind of a hybrid type thing, but, you know, what I'm trying to avoid is these hundred plus percent changes. I think that is a lot. I like a great deal the fact that some people in their earliest years of practice and or under under a hundred thousand dollars of income would pay less than they're paying now. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Um, I very much appreciate having three options um, presented and the specificity of the number of attorneys that fall into each category for each of the options. I think that gives us a lot of good information and data to have this kind of discussion. Um, one of the factors I think about is um, what is the simplest to administer that takes the least amount of additional staff time um, because I'd be worried about adopting a system that requires that we add staff to administer it, uh, given you know that that we're trying to be thoughtful about how to be most efficient. 
with our resources. So that's one thought. So in some ways, it seems to me that door number one, just on the face of it, uh, uh, appears to have, um, you know, um, be most attractive. I know door number two is also easy, to, um, you know, because we know how many years people have been in practice, but I'm, I'm, I'm very um, sensitive to Trustee Huber's uh, point about um, just because an attorney has 30 plus years, uh, some people are into semi-retirement by then, winding down practices, um, and, um, you know, so, so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Um, I, what I would question is in the spirit of seeing if we can mitigate some of the extremes of increases, I would actually, and I'm saying this as a nonprofit ex executive, I don't know that we need uh, this kind of, this magnitude of fee reduction for nonprofits. Um, I mean, nonprofits who employ attorneys have been budgeting for these bar fees for years. That's just how it works, okay? So um, I, I, and I, you know, I, I'm saying this as someone that employs about a dozen attorneys, okay, just to be completely transparent. It, it, it's in my budget, okay? And um, it, it's expected, it's the cost of doing business, it's worth every penny of it. And um, I know I'm not looking for a decrease here, okay? So I, I, I just would like that as a consideration that that, might give a little wiggle room to, um, as, as some of the other trustees have said, you know, can we get under 100% uh, even on the highest ones? I, I do agree with that. Um, we were talking earlier about a 24% uh, of being a shock. Well, it seems like 100% would be four times the shock, just, you know, at least for some folks. So th th that's something I would like us to think about that we we, we may not, really need that um you know so that's what i'm thinking okay thank you miss hershkowitz yeah thank you in, in response to mr tony i wanted to point out that there are um there are two two general sense of the board that were that were seeking care um uh one is um should we apply the this different free structure, whichever one you, you you elect, to just the $150 increase, or should we apply it to the entire fee? If we just apply it to the $150 increase, we don't have the result that Mr. Tony was talking about. Um, it's just a lesser increase for the nonprofits using that example. Um, so I think there's that's one question for all of you. Do you apply it to the, in, the entire fee or just the increase? And then knowing that, then sort of the um, getting getting your sense among the, the three different options. The only thing I would add is we can always submit all three options and the pro rata when we submit the report. We are not statutorily you know, directed to do anything in this regard. So certainly we could say like a preference and, and to your point, um, Trustee Tony, a preference that relates to the administrative burden um, because income would be very difficult for us, right? We'd have to audit, it's easy to lie about it and you'd need to audit it. So, um, so we could do preference, but we could submit all of them. But I think um, Donna's making a great point. If you only apply the new structure to the growth, nobody gets an, a decrease. This is also a question that we posed in the survey that's currently out to licensees. Um, so. Yeah, I certainly am in favor of sending all three to the legislature with the, you know, the appropriate data. Um, I, I would think, I do think it would be helpful um, to let the legislature know just what way the board is leaning. So um, I would try and, try to get a consensus today on which of the three options there might be more uh, more agreement on can we 
put a friendly amendment that Sarah recommended that uh, we do have a, a, a difference for corporations because corporations could be, you know, startups with two people or they could be multi-billion dollar organizations. Yeah, just looking to staff, how difficult would that be in this stage of the process to, to break out? I, I don't know, but I, I don't think it's impossible. I think we can do it. We could also, if the board wanted to set as a policy matter, let's say you were going to apply the new model to the entire fee, but you don't want anybody to receive a fee reduction. Maybe they can just have a, no increase. But the, if you want to set that as a as policy direction, then that gives us the room to perhaps soften the the blow between medium and large firms, or to and or to create tiers within the corporate um, sector. So, I think we can you know we can do our best. And when we submit the data, we can if when we submit this report to the legislature, we can be clear about what data we do and don't have, and how we might propose to get it. But I know we can do more with the data we have on the corporate side and looking at market cap is, is pretty easy. All right, I see a lot of nodding heads as to what's been articulated by Trustee Huser and then um, Leah. Any strong opposition, strong support, any of the other, other options or structuring? Going once, going twice. All right. Looking now to back to staff. Are there any other items here that uh, that we need uh, the direction of the board for? I don't is Donna. I just thought again, sort of just a general sense of the board. Would would you be leaning? more toward applying it to the entire fee or or applying it just to the proposed increase? I, I, I'm seeing nods and head shaking uh, for uh, favoring applying it to the entire fee. Am I reading that correctly? I'm, I'm still seeing those nods. So, yeah, so that sounds like that would be if we're gonna provide a so we can do the math for all of it, as Leah said, but we'll do a, this is the sense of the board, option one with the sizing for in-house, we've resized for in-house counsel um, and that it applied to the entire fee. I, I like that my my preference is, um, I, I, I liked very much the suggestion that um, nobody get an actual decrease, but that, it, you know, stay the same then it's it feels a little bit more fair um, for the other um, categories because they need to feel a little fair too. So it's just a increase. No, you know, I, I got it. We can we can work it up. So right. I think we did not do the consent calendar on Monday. Is that right, Louisa? Correct. Yes. But, but before we move on from this, any other direction the staff needs? I don't think so. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, going over, going back to uh, the consent calendar. All right, well, this concludes our uh, discussion on item 702. I want to go to consent agenda to item 50. And I understand that item 50-2 will be pulled for um, a presentation by George Cardona. And so I would ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of 50-2. So moved. Second. Okay, first by Trustee Huser, second by Trustee Buenaventura. Um, Madam Secretary, can I have a roll call vote? Vera Honan. Aye. Buenaventura. Aye. Chen, not present. Cisneros. Aye. Good. Trustee, good. Not present. Huser? Aye. Shelby, not present. Stevens? Aye. Soel? Aye. Tony? Aye. Trejo? Aye. Stallings? Aye.
Nine ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Now turning to item 50-2, this is a presentation by uh, our Chief Trial Counsel, George Cardona. Thank you. So item 50-2 is a series of amendments that are basically correcting and clarifying amendments to clear up um, some errors in this in uh, rules to clarify cross references to various statutes and make some adjustments for case law. Uh, we put these out for public comment. We received a public comment only on one of the amendments with respect to rule 2502, which was generally in favor of it. However, um, the day before the last meeting or the day of the last meeting, we received a public comment letter, um, which I believe has been circulated, if I can confirm with Louisa. Yes. So that's been circulated. And as you'll note, they correctly pointed out that there was a typo in a portion of that. So if I can put up, is it okay, Louisa, if I share my screen? Yes. So just quickly, this was the proposed amendment which I hope you can now see, um, to Rule 2502. And the typo was in the clean version. Um, and there were two things that were left out. First, this line where I've got the cursor, which I can highlight, I think. Well, I'll try to see if this works. Uh, B1 through B5 through five should have been B1 through B5. And here where it references subdivision B8 through I14, it should have been B8 through B14. Um, it is correct in the red line. In other words, the red line has this correct, um, but for whatever reason that didn't carry over into the clean version. Um, so I would ask for basically approval with this minor amendment to correct the typo in the clean version. Um, the public comment, um, uh, argues that um, it shouldn't be approved at this time, but should be passed on to another meeting with uh, additional opportunity for public comment because people might have been confused about what they were commenting on. I don't believe that's necessary, and I don't believe that issue is well taken since the clean version did indicate the correct versions. I mean, the red line version indicated the correct changes, um, and it would be fairly apparent that what was in the clean version was a typographical error. Um, so with that, that's... Um, that's basically the presentation on, on this matter. Great, and thank I'd you, ask, Mr. Carter. I would ask for the board to approve the resolution with the minor amendment that the attachment would be modified to correct the typo in the clean version of Rule 2502. Thank you. And do we have a, a resolution to that effect? Yes, we do. All right. Before we move to the resolution, any questions for George or comments? All right, seeing none, uh, if we could put the resolution up, please. All right, after everybody's had a chance to review, I'm gonna have a motion. So it's clear if you vote for this, the attachment G that's referred to would be the attachment G with the typos corrected. Move to approve. Okay, first by Trustee Buenaventura. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Stevens. Uh, Madam Secretary, can I have a roll call vote, please? Vera Hone. Aye. Buenaventura? Aye. Chen, not present. Cisneros? Aye. Good, not present. Huser? Aye. Shelby, not present. Stevens? Aye. Sowell? Aye. Tony? Aye. Trejo? Aye. Stallings? Aye. Nine ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Before we adjourn the, uh, this meeting, I, I do understand that Trustee Barahone had a question about um, one of the public comments. And uh, while it's not agendized, we will not be taking um, any action in regards to this, but merely informational only. So Trustee Barahone, did you have a, a, a question? Yeah, on, on, the, on the public comment around the, the Cow Palace uh, testing location, 
Um, it seems, um, I'm just curious if there's anything we can do to find more information and uh, respond to this in some in some way, perhaps um, in the future, um, either on the, the steps we're taking on testing sites and going into the future and how we address or remedy the situation on the current location in Cal Palace. Just curious if there's anything we can do there. Yes, and I asked for Bridget to join. I don't Yes, Bria. She's joining. Okay. Can you respond briefly, Bridget? Thanks. Sure. I think while I was being promoted, I missed whatever you just said. <laughs> but I'm I think you were just asking about um the public comment in the Cow Palace and some of the things that we've heard in the news so far. So we are um gathering more information about what has happened. We're still compiling information from staff. Um we have to be honest, we have heard about the cold, but from what staff has been reporting to us, there were also people that were warm and then they they you know resolved the issue. My understanding it was it was largely resolved by the afternoon on Tuesday. Um people were um so so we have that in mind. And then um we will we're we're just trying to get a little bit more information about all of the things that that have transpired. Um, so we can do that and maybe provide an update at our next meeting, if that would be helpful. Just to add a little bit, we had about 600 test takers that I think were impacted by the temperature issues. I, I don't want to contradict you, Bridget, but I think we, we have determined that it was cold in the morning. It was really cold. Yes. And then they did like adjust the heat. Maybe it got too hot. So certainly there were some temperature issues on that first day. Yes. And um, I just learned about the bathroom issue. I think we all did today. So we don't have new information on the bathrooms, uh, but we're looking into that. And then in terms of remedies for test takers, we can, working with our psychometrician, look into whether um, grading remedies might be appropriate. So it's a balance because there are often issues with exam sites and we don't always um, implement test grading type remedies, but this may warrant it and certainly something we can look into and report back on. Yes, I will say I did get one update during the board meeting on the bathrooms with respect to um, it, it is a secure location. That is a very common thing that they everybody needs to exit where when it's a secure location going on. And there were some alternatives there. But again, we are looking into more about the details. All right. Trustee Barhona, any other questions about that? No, thank you so much for looking into it. I think it'd be helpful to get an update at the, the next meeting. Yes, we will do that. All right, it's 2.55 p.m., five minutes to spare. So enjoy a coffee break or, or whatever you have, um, but absolutely enjoy uh, your weekend. Thank you again for your availability um, on this continued uh, meeting and uh, certainly uh, very important issues we're discussing here. Thank you for your input. Staff, thank you so much for your work on this. I know it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, large task to take on. So I, I do appreciate the clarity and the uh, presentation that really guided us today. So thank you all, meetings adjourned. We'll see you in a couple of days, a couple of weeks at least. All right, thanks everyone for all your input. Bye. Yep.